Well, I invite you to open up your Bible to the book of John. Turn to chapter 19. This evening, John chapter 19. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 30. Referring to the cross upon which Jesus died, John Piper, in his book, Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ, states this. The agonies of the Son of God were incomparable. No one ever suffered like this man. No one ever deserved suffering less, yet received so much. The only person in history who did not deserve to suffer, suffered most. No one has ever borne so much injustice with so little vengeance. Not because the torment was tolerable. If we had been forced to watch we probably would have passed out, end quote. The death of Jesus was horrific. It can and should be a bit uncomfortable to ponder what our Lord endured upon the cross. But we must consider this for it is upon this event, upon Jesus' death on the cross, that the gospel stands. It is upon the most tragic event of all of humanity that the most glorious reality, the most precious truth springs forth. The greatest injustice ever committed is the launching pad for that which God receives eternal, infinite praise and glory for. The most atrocious act in all of humanity, God used to lead to the greatest good for humanity. That is the selfless sacrifice of the Son of God on behalf of all who would believe. This evening, we're going to look at that account unfold. So read with me the account of Jesus' death from John 19, starting in verse 17. John chapter 19, starting in verse 17. It says, They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him, two other men, one on either side, And Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put on it, put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. And then verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
the account of Jesus' death unfolds in five scenes for us this evening. The account of Jesus' death unfolds in five scenes. Jesus' death was a horrible, tragic event. And this evening, we will see it unfold in five sobering scenes. And we need to remember what has taken place up to this point in verse 17. We we need to remember the emotional, the, the physical, the spiritual torment that Jesus had already faced. You remember Jesus agonized in the garden, sweating blood. He was insulted by numerous hypocrites. His beard was ripped out. They covered his face with their spit. They scourged him being lacerated by whips to the point that his body was mangled and unrecognizable. Thorns pressed into his skull, stripped to the point of indignity. Jesus has endured up to this point so much pain, so much agony, so much disrespect as he is walking to his death. And now we come to the worst of it. Verse 17 gives way to the cross as the first scene of the account of Jesus' death. This first scene, we see Jesus' horrific crucifixion is summarized. That's in verses 17 and 18. Jesus' horrific crucifixion is summarized. Look again at verse 17. It says, They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. We see a a summary of the horrific crucifixion that Jesus endured. Pilate delivered his sentence. And then delivered Jesus over to the guards and the soldiers who would carry out this deed, this crucifixion, the soldiers now mocking him, beating him, making Jesus carry his own cross, which was customary to bring upon the criminal shame. This was standard procedure. And the sight of the beaten, bloodied prisoner was meant to strike fear in the people. This was business as usual for these guards. They're doing what they would always do, crucifying another criminal, just another outlaw. And in this moment, judgment was coming on them. Judgment was not coming on them. It wasn't coming on them, but rather judgment was falling on the Savior who took every blow He took every punch, yet he knew every one of their names, their lives, everything that would condemn them in eternity. And more than that, he didn't just know it, but he silently and willingly walked to his own death, carrying his own cross, all while wanting and longing for the salvation of sinners, just like the ones who were leading him there. Even some who committed these vile acts against the Son of God directly. In fact, in Luke 23 34, after all that had been done to Jesus, his first words he speaks during his crucifixion, after the nails, after being set up on the cross, after the humiliation, the first thing he says is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. The treasure of the gospel shines forth in this statement as the Savior prays this prayer. And after all of the agony, he does this. After the nails have gone in, after the jarring of the cross being stood up and the pressure being put on those puncture wounds, after the struggle and labor of each breath, the first thing Jesus says is a prayer to the Father asking for forgiveness for the very ones who hung him there. Have you ever wondered if God could possibly forgive you for the sin you've committed? Have you ever felt at an impasse? You thought you wanted what Jesus offers, but your assessment of yourself is that you are too far gone. Your sin too offensive, unforgivable. Maybe there is secret sin in your life. No one knows about it, but you. 
This sin has been a stumbling block for you to come to Jesus because you're convinced it disqualifies you from forgiveness somehow? Or, or the shame is so severe? And, and just listen, there is no sin that Jesus will not forgive you if you humbly confess it as such and repent, turning to him. It is the heart of Christ to rescue sinners. That's why he came, not for the righteous. He came for sinners. So if you've pondered if your sin can be forgiven. Let this be a resounding yes to you this evening. The work of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus is fully capable to forgive you your sins, whatever they may be. Humble yourself, confess your sin, repent of your sin, cling to Jesus. He was eager to extend it, pray for it, even upon the cross. John gives us some other details in his summary here of Jesus' crucifixion. The execution site was called the place of the skull. This is outside of the city, outside of Jerusalem, and he was crucified with two other criminals, just as if it were another day and he was another common criminal. All of these seemingly minor details fulfilling the Father's plan perfectly, many of which were prophesied of. You see, crucifixion was regarded as the worst, most shameful, horrible form of execution. And it was so bad that Roman citizens were not to be crucified. It was reserved for the worst of the worst. And there Jesus is hanging with two other criminals. Yet as the three of them hung there, the suffering of the two criminals in that moment was nothing. It was nothing compared to the suffering to the infinitely greater suffering of Jesus as he was bearing the righteous wrath for sin of all who would believe upon him. Truly is an astonishing reality. So we see this account of Jesus' death unfold first as we see Jesus' horrific crucifixion is summarized. Next, number two, this evening, we see the account of Jesus' death unfold and Jesus' true kingship being ascribed. Jesus' true kingship is ascribed. We see that in verses 19 through 22. Look down again at 19. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. And there we see his true kingship being ascribed. This didn't sit well with everyone who was involved. Verse 20, therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription. Look at, look at verse 20 there. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. You see, Jesus' true kingship is ascribed and it's done so through the sinfulness of man. It was customary to place on a placard the crime for which one was being condemned. In Jesus' case, no crime was committed. Thus, Pilate decided, seeing as he was pressed into this by the Jews, pressured into this to take a shot at them and had an inscription put on the cross, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. And just to be sure everyone could read it, he had it written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews went to Pilate, obviously upset and disturbed. Pilate got it wrong and they plead, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. They wanted him to change the wording so that Christ would appear to be an imposter. But Pilate simply refuses, most likely out of spite for the Jews. And God uses sinful men in a sinful spat to accomplish his, his sovereign purposes. 
Neither Pilate nor the Jewish leaders believed Jesus was the king of the Jews, yet he was. And not only that, Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And in that moment, Jesus turns an instrument of torture to a throne of glory and he reigns from a tree. Even though circumstances seem dire, he is no less in control of every detail. Isn't that comforting? Isn't that comforting? Have you ever been in a trial? Have you ever been in the midst of a trial and just thought, where are you, God? God, where are you? Let me assure you, even in the most difficult trial, the most tragic report, the most agonizing circumstance, he is no less near. He is in no less control. He is no less faithful in those moments, in your, in your affliction, in your trials, in your struggles. He is near and he is sovereign and he is good. God desired that history give testimony that the Messiah was rejected by his people. Jesus was innocent. He went around healing people. He preached kindness and forgiveness and grace and his own people called for his crucifixion. How corrupt is the human heart that people would crucify and kill their own savior. How evil people are to deceive themselves into thinking they can make it to God on their own. When the old Testament promised he was the one to come. How sinister people are in their heart to be so hypocritical to think they are righteous while they, while they crucify the truly innocent one. They kill the truly innocent man who takes it silently like a lamb to the slaughter. And through sinful vengeance, Jesus' true kingship is ascribed, giving testimony to his divine sovereignty every step of the way. There wasn't one step on the road to Calvary that wasn't sovereignly ordained. The next scene that unfolds in this sobering account of Jesus' death that we see is not only his true kingship being ascribed, but number three, Jesus' comprehensive sovereignty is demonstrated. And this really goes hand in hand with what we've just been looking at. Jesus' comprehensive, his complete, his, his exhaustive sovereignty, it covers every detail is demonstrated. We see that in verse 23 through the first part of 25, look down again at verse 23. This scene involves the soldiers. This, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part, for, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture they divided my outer garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. When Jesus should be at his weakest, all of his purposes are coming to pass. Here is prophetic fulfillment during Jesus' crucifixion from Psalm 22. The execution squad normally included four soldiers under the command of a centurion and clothes would be divided among the four soldiers, but so as not to make the tunic worthless, they see it better as they are acting purely on selfish motives to cast lots in order to decide who would get it. And Jesus' complete comprehensive sovereignty is demonstrated. There is no moment ever where Jesus is not reigning and orchestrating all things for his glory. Even here, God is directing and ordaining and bringing about all of his purposes. 
And in verse 24, when it says this was to fulfill the scripture, uh, the soldiers weren't doing it to fulfill the scripture. God was sovereignly ordaining them to do it so that the scripture would be fulfilled. This is God's doing. God upholds his word. He always does. He always upholds his word. When from a worldly perspective, it seems that all power and authority and purpose of Jesus has been thwarted by sinful men. John shows us Jesus was no less in control as he hung on the cross. Jesus is infinitely transcendent. And listen, if Jesus was no less in control when he hung on the cross, in this, in this darkest of hours, if he was no less in control when he hung on the cross, being crucified, mocked, ridiculed, but was actually bringing about his perfect will, how much confidence, how much confidence can we have in this life? How much confidence can we have in this life's hardships when it feels that all hope is lost, that all purpose is drowned, that all is undone? How much confidence can we have as we gaze at our Savior's amazing sovereignty in his darkest hour? His complete control. How much confidence can we have in our darkest times that he is near, that he is good, that he is no less in control, that he has a plan, that he has a purpose, that we can trust him. We just can't allow our circumstances to compromise our confidence in the faithfulness of God. This is a, a season of trial in light of various circumstances I know that are going on in the lives of people in our church, in your lives. Numerous difficult trials. It's hard. Sickness, chronic pain, difficult relationships, implications of COVID-19 on people's lives and certainty about the future. Just want to assure you, Jesus is no less in control today. Dads, as you navigate working from home and being faithful as an employee and faithful as a husband and faithful as a dad, Jesus is near. Moms, as you adjust to homeschooling your kids, having all of the normal energy outlets and breaks for you, for your children to do no longer available. And when you feel at your wits end, as you balance all of your regular responsibilities becoming more complex and more difficult, and then educate your children in addition to that and navigate jobs and responsibilities, the Lord Jesus is no less near. Teachers, as you aim at a constantly moving target, to move all of your curriculum online and seek to work in the world with parents and students. And you labor so hard to serve those families so well and just feel like it's a impossible task. As you do this juggling also the care of your own family and most likely kids, I just want to remind you, just want to remind you of the love of Jesus of the sovereignty of Jesus. He is near to you. He is no less in control. Children, as the public activities that you are used to enjoying are not allowed in 
the friends that you have that you love to play with and spend time with, you are separated from, I want to encourage you to trust in Jesus in this time. You can trust him. He's in control. This is a difficult season to be a child. High school seniors, college seniors. Oh, my heart aches for you. And yet in all of the disappointments of what you thought and hoped this time would be like for you, you can trust God in this time. Jesus' complete sovereignty was put on display as he was hanging on the cross, being crucified. He is in control. We would have had no explanation at the cross that would somehow bring to us comfort outside of merely trusting God's word and having faith in him if we were there. And yet he used that most difficult, atrocious, sinful act to bring about an immeasurable good, an infinite good, an eternity altering good. You can trust God, even though you don't understand. He is in control. First responders, doctors, nurses, essential care workers in your weariness, let the contemplation of the divine sovereignty of our Lord as he hangs on the cross comfort you in this difficult time. And I'm sure there are many other categories that I'm missing where of those who are hurting and those who are in trials right now. And still the same Jesus is in control and he is trustworthy. And though the night might feel long, he is faithful. He is. If you're in a trial right now, if you are struggling to endure it, if you are hurting, all of the elders, any of the elders would love to be available to hear from you to pray with you, to pray for you, to encourage you with God's word. We would love to walk with you in your sorrow, in your struggle. You can reach out to any of us from the website. You can get our emails. You can contact the church office. We would love to be available for you. Well, this leads into our next scene where we see Jesus' intimate love is expressed. Jesus' intimate love is expressed. We see that in the second half of verse 25 through 27. Not only is Jesus supremely sovereign in every detail of his crucifixion, but his love is not deterred. His compassion is not hindered or set aside in the moment of all of Jesus' transcendence, all of his sovereignty being put on display, all of the agony that he is experiencing. You have this beautiful moment as Jesus' intimate love is expressed. Look at verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. In verse 27, then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Household. And all of the agony and all of the pain and all of the vile sin and all of the atrocity, there is this tender moment as Jesus cares for his mother. Mother, behold your son. If ever there was a time for Jesus, attention to be fixed on himself, it was here. Yet he can't do it. As he cares for his mother in this moment, he's not wanting everyone to get into his shoes. He's not fixed on his moment of trial and all his suffering. He is rather filled with compassion and intimate love, knowing the heartache of a loving mother watching her son be ripped apart and crucified. 
Every mother can imagine what it must have been like and even then can't fathom something fully like this until you're in it. Her son is, is broken and her heart is devastated. Jesus knows that in losing a son, she is gaining a savior. He knows he will rise from the grave. He knows of the temporal nature of her sorrow, yet he is still tender in his care for her. And he understands and knows her heartbreak and knows her fears and knows her concerns. And he tends to her in that moment. There is a shocking tenderness and relational love and burden for a broken heart. And he says to the disciple that he loved, John, behold, John, your mother, take care of her. Jesus in his darkest hour puts his mother's needs above his own. And oh, the staggering compassion demonstrated by Jesus at his own crucifixion. Here we see Jesus isn't only aware of the needs of his people. He is deeply and richly providing for them. Which begs the question, do you believe Jesus will care for you? Jesus hasn't forgotten our needs. He sees them from heaven like he saw them from the cross. He will draw near to your life in intimate love and care. And just as he looked down, just as he looked down from the cross and saw his mother's needs, he looks down from his glorious exalted position and he sees your life if you are in him. There is nothing in your life that he doesn't know isn't orchestrating and will not tend to you in using it for your good and for his own glory. Lastly, this evening, as we close the last scene of Jesus' death, we see as Jesus' unrelenting commitment is displayed. Jesus' unrelenting commitment is displayed. This is in verses 28 through 30. This is an unrelenting commitment to the Father's will. He has an unrelenting commitment to the Father's will, and that's put on display. That's put on display. Nothing, not the smallest detail, will be overlooked by Jesus. He has an unrelenting commitment to the Father's will. Look at the last few verses, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, He would not allow himself to die until all things were completed fully to fulfill the scripture pertaining to his death. Knowing this, he said, I am thirsty and a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus has an unrelenting commitment to the Father's will, even to the point of death. Jesus at the center of his heart in the crucifixion, it was the will of God. At the core of who he was and what he desired to see accomplished on Calvary was the Father's will. He loved it. He loved the father's will above all else so much that nothing would rob him of the pleasure of walking in it, even though it took his life, even though it meant separation from the father, even though it meant wrath and judgment placed upon him. In Jesus' final moments, he was thinking about all that had to take place to fulfill the scripture, to fulfill the father's will for the father's glory. And we see one last fulfillment before he breathes his last breath. And so he says he is thirsty. He refused this pain doling drink earlier. And now he's ready to drink, not for the easement of pain, but for the fulfillment of his father's will. And he drinks it. And after doing so with not a cry of defeat, but one of victory, the most tragically wonderful words were spoken by Jesus as he cried out, it is finished. Nothing else needed to be added to what Jesus did on the cross. Not by Jesus on the cross and not by you today. 
After everything, Jesus, still in full control of his own life, finally allows himself to die, bowing his head and giving up his spirit. Nobody took his life from him. He laid it down as a ransom. His blood was shed. His body was broken. And the son of God breathed his last upon that cross. Let's pray. God, as we visit again this evening, the reality of your crucifixion, it is sobering. The reality of sin is shocking. And the sin of those there is no greater than our own. And the punishment and wrath that they deserved is what we deserved. And yet for those who place their trust in you, who turn from their sin, who confess, there is actually benefit in your crucifixion that leads to eternal salvation, forgiveness of sins, reconciliation to you. So Father, I pray that as we ponder this horrific scene of your sons being crucified, I pray that we would once again be stirred afresh with gratefulness and awe and wonder leading to humility and appropriate fear of you. We have nothing to look to, nothing to proclaim, nothing to declare, but Christ and what he has accomplished. So I pray that we would do that. In Jesus' name, amen.